Um, I can fill you in a little bit on how things have advanced. Um, and I'm not going to do, do a lot up here unless, unless there's questions or things that, that people are asking that there's stuff I can show you about. But they, the teams within the school, um, so right, you've got your principals lead, leading their own schools. We've got um, curriculum coordinators that are talking um, with their curriculum teams and whatnot. And so all these groups are actually having similar conversations about uh, the homework policy, what's good, what's bad, what, what should be changed, what are things that are there that people should be aware of that we might not have thought of yet. And so all those parts and pieces have, have been rolling in um, over the last couple of days. And then we're going to sit down and, um, with the cabinet and start to kind of consolidate all the, the ideas that have come up. Um, we started a conversation here the last time that we were together, um, which I can't believe it was o over a month ago. Um, but uh, if I remember going back and checking my notes, um, we had talked about a number of things. And the last piece that we were kind of on and kind of discussing um, at the time was kind of, you know, impact on sports and after school extracurriculars and things like that. And so um, happy to kind of pick up again. It's an odd protocol. Um, I, my job is just to kind of listen, take notes, ask clarifying questions. If you have something that you want me to respond to, just tell me to. Um, but the, the reason for me not responding to a lot of it um, is just because I don't want to mess up your thoughts and I want to make sure that you get them all out so that we get, get a chance to hear them, if that makes sense. So good. All right, so who's, who's first? I have a question. Yeah. With, with an added homework policy and shifting schedules, will teachers be allowed more time in the day to plan and grade paperworks or receive greater compensation for the extra work they would be putting in? Uh, homework typically, especially the way that we're looking at, is a normal expected duty. Um, so I, I would say probably not. Um, in terms of planning time, there is a big difference, though, that, that you're touching on, which is right between elementary school and high school. Um, high school, because they typically teach five out of the seven classes, they have kind of natural planning time that's built in. Some do have duties, some do not. Elementary school I worry a little bit more about um, because they tend to be with the students more of the day. So they don't get as much planning time. So one of the things that we've been doing to try to bolster that a little bit is we've been increasing the amount of time that the librarians um, have. They used to only be have librarians one day a week. Um, we've got them up to three, and I'm hoping over the next year or so through the budget process to get them up to full time. And that way the students are working on digital literacy with the, um, the librarians while the teachers can do the planning um, to help out a little bit. So good question. Other thoughts and, and parts and pieces? Um, speaking of like the elementary schools, so do you have an idea of in comparing like SBAC scores between like Brookfield, Braintree, and Randolph? Um, does Brook like how does that do they are they pretty evenly aligned or is one school way above another or how does that? It's it's changed. Um, I might even be able to throw the data up for you, but, but let's see if, see if I can describe it a little bit. Um, and again, things got really weird during COVID because the data wasn't, it was indicative, but it wasn't giving you real information that you could latch on to. Um, typically, uh, prior to COVID, um, the three schools, they were, they were fairly close. There was a, a little bit of separation um, to them. Historically, Brookfield was always kind of the highest performer. Um, Braintree is and has been for quite a while. Um, Brookfield is second, but it's been improving. Um, Randolph uh, was third, but it's, it had this really weird year in COVID that we can't explain, where all three schools, their scores were growing or improving. Um, but Randolph had a year, I think it was two years ago, that their score dropped like 30 to 50 points in one year. And then they recovered the year afterwards. And so it didn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And so I did uh, talk with, with Erica, who was the principal there at one time, to kind of try to do a little bit of research on what happened. Um, typically, when you see something like that, um, it's one of two things. Um, and it does happen. It used to happen in, on MCAS in Massachusetts is there's error in the test correcting that happens. Or the students just weren't taking it seriously for whatever reason. Um, and we did go in and, and look, and you know, when you have a test that's supposed to go an hour and a half, and the students are spending, 
you know, 15 minutes or less on it. You know, that's, that's pretty indicative. But then the follow-up question is, okay, did they spend 15 minutes on it because they just weren't taking it seriously, didn't feel it was a big deal, especially with COVID and everything else that was going on? Um, or were they not engaging in it as fully as they could because they were anxious, they were nervous, or they just didn't know? Um, the, the just not knowing piece doesn't quite fit the pattern because, like I said, their, their scores have been improving for quite a while. Most of them... Um, Prior to COVID, the elementaries um, were at or close to 70% hitting proficiency. With state averages tend to be around 50%, give or take a couple of points. So they were doing really well. Above average of the state average. Yeah. <clears throat> so the reason I bring that up is so Brookfield hasn't had, with the idea of like mandating homework in the elementary schools, Brookfield hasn't had homework in their in the school since for six years. Yep. So it doesn't seem to align with the argument that if they have more homework, uh -huh. then they're going to perform better and be better acquainted with the material and make better connections. Yeah. So, let, so let's fill in the blanks again. And again, I, I'm not going to say that there's a causal relationship, right? There's correlation and there's, there's cause. Correlation means it looks like one, one might be impacting the other, but you're not sure. Causal means you're, you're sure it's causing it. Um, the change that happened, so Brookfield scores had fallen um, kind of early on. Um, they've been improving lately uh, probably due to a lot of the work that the two curriculum directors are doing. Um, Braintree was not ahead of Brookfield until uh, probably the last five years or so, um, two or three years before COVID. And the one difference that Braintree has that Brookfield does not is they do 20 minutes of homework a night. So were the Brookfield scores higher? Like, do we have da data that shows that seven years ago and se seven to 12 years ago, Brookfield scores were higher? Yeah, Brookfield, um, if you go back, uh, way back when I started, Brookfield scores were always the highest. And then uh, probably over the course of time, and again, I'm... I'm We'll see what I can find here if I've got the complete. I may have to do some searching over the last five years of where the data is. But they had fallen behind. Braintree kind of took over. But one of the big differences, because they do try to keep equality between the elementary schools, one of the big differences is that they, they do have a homework, homework plan. All right, performance. Data. Let's see if we got the longitudinal. Well, there's statistics. And SPAC, they haven't even given us last year's data yet. Um, and of course, the Secretary of Education is leaving, and I wonder if the two are related. Uh, let's see when the last we had data. All right, so brain tree. Uh, last year, I'm trying to remember when the last year before COVID was. I think COVID was 2020, right? Yes. So 2019. Up here, give me a minute to orient myself. All right. So what you see happening, so this is 2019. So this is the percentage of students in each grade that hit the proficiency threshold. Um, so they had been doing work for a couple of years there, so it kind of makes a little bit of sense. Um, right, third grade, 47% were hitting the proficiency level, fourth grade, uh, 57%, fit, you know, fifth grade, 80%, sixth grade, 73%. What school is this? So this is, this is Braintree um, down here at this point in time, and so that was 2019. And even just looking at this, um, right, 80 you see kind of the change over time. Let's go back to 2015, right? They were between 22. They had one really high year in there, one, one really stellar class. But typically, they were in the in anywhere between the 20 and, and 40% um, percent range. Um, and so they, they've made some pretty dramatic uh, improvements. So let's go to Brookfield. Actually, hold on. Let's go back. And that was for ELA. Let's take a look at Met this is ELA data up here. This is math data here. Right? And the math data is going to be a little bit more impacted because of the, the, the COVID years, when we get to the COVID years, because 
typically it's it's foundational it builds on itself but let me reorient all right so 53 29 so the math is between 30 29 and 60 and kind of when they started you know they had a, a 56 in there but you know they were anywhere from 16 percent they were in the 20s to 16 percent yeah um, in terms of overall you can kind of see the change over time so if you look at the average percentage of students that are hitting proficiency each year so in Braintree Right in 20, 2017, it was 60.8%. 2018, it was 76%. 2019, it was 66. Right, and this even includes, and they, they came back really strong after after COVID. And excuse me, that's ELA, and then the math. You can kind of see the changes. They've even come back um, completely above where they were prior to COVID, which is unheard of in the state, um, based upon the the last round of data that we actually had from them. So let's take a look at Brookfield. This is probably the easier number to take a look at. So if you take a look at Brookfield, right, 2017, so like I said, four or five years ago, right, they were lagging behind a little bit. And if you take a look back to 2015, they were actually higher up here in terms of where their scores were. And so that's the ELA, and this is the math. Um, RES, let's see if we can find the weird year. A little bit closer to a little bit closer to Brookfield. In some cases, exceeds Brookfield. In some cases, it's below. Um, but they had a really bad year in 2021, right? So in terms of ELA, more than half of the kids were hitting the proficiency or higher. For some reason, in 2021, 20, uh, you see this huge drop, right? You know, there's a 20 point drop there, and then they kind of recovered. Um, in math, the drop was huge. I mean, when they went from 52% one year to 17, and then the next year they jumped back up. And so that's why I'm saying I don't think it was a knowledge thing. I think it was either the kids weren't taking this seriously or they misgraded the tests. Um, but. So which school were you saying that they haven't had homework for? Time? In Brookfield, they no. haven't had homework, and it doesn't seem like their test scores are farther behind than drastically farther behind than Randolph or Braintree. Well, I remember, so 2021, these, they've been improving. So they're, they're hitting 70% in ELA. Let's take a look at where Brookfield is. They're 40 to mid fifties. Can you look at Randolph? Yeah. You want to look at the, the elementary school, right? Um, so Randolph, right, kind of the, the same thing, right, where the other one was hitting, hitting 70s. These guys are, you know, they're in, they're in the, the, the 30, 40, 50 range, right, depending upon what you look at. And again, that, that one year, I don't, because it's not explainable in the recovery afterwards, I think it's just bad, bad data, and I probably should even eliminate it from the list. Um, but again, the, the big difference, and I think there, it sounded like, and so to put things in a time perspective, um, what I discovered because, uh, you know, Richard up at Brookfield had brought up, oh, you know, we looked at some research, and the research said the homework doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, so I went and I, re I talked with uh, Melinda and a little bit with uh, Kara um, because uh, they were looking at that research, I think, my first year here, which was around 2017. And so that's when Brookfield decided that they weren't going to do homework. Um, Braintree continued with it. And again, you see that that's when the scores are different. You know, prior to that, you know, Brookfield was actually... And it was a first-year teacher there. That was his first year. Could, so there's a little bit of... Could, could, could be. Right. So can I, can I say definitively that um, the, the difference between the two is that? No. Um, but I, I have a feeling that it's, it, it had to have some impact. And even John Hattie's work, which is the work that they were looking at um, in terms of the research saying that, yeah, because of this we don't believe in, um, believe that homework's impactful. But John Hattie said a, actually a couple of things. Um, the first one, which was really important, was that his correlations actually showed that there was improvement at the elementary level as well as the high school level with homework just that the improvement at the elementary level didn't tend to be as great. And then he went on to be very specific about it, and his, his concern was, and I probably have the quote if, if, if you want me to look for it, was that he did what was called a meta-study. So he didn't do any of his own research. He looked at you know, hundreds of 
other people's research to see what patterns emerge from it. Yeah. You said that, uh, so Brookfield didn't have homework, right? Braintree has 20 minutes of homework a night and for... That's kind of their standard right now. Okay, and is that for each class that gives 20 minutes of homework every night or...? Yeah. Now, now, would I say that they're all 100% consistent about that? No, but it, but but it, it is it is it is the norm. Um, so you know, most days you could expect that. Okay. Is that for all grades? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Matter okay. of fact, then I reviewed it too because I was looking at the notes that they sent over um, as a part of it. Go ahead. Question: In regards to upper level high school education, I know many students who are who do not spend their have idle time in much of their time out of school. Instead, they are forced to work for a variety yeah. of reasons. I myself work a job, and an increased homework load or increased part stress from this policy would likely require, like, result in them prioritizing their work over their school as they would be forced to do. And in this prioritization would not ben a, this forced prioritization would not further benefit their education if you look at it from that perspective, because of the relatively high poverty rates in our localized area. I agree with the fact that it has had a marketable impact on grades at, in more wealthy areas, such as, uh, I think most I've read were in a few <coughs> specific examples in Massachusetts, but yet in lower income schools, an increased homework load just forced an, an issue there, and then when work inevitably wins, mm. people just pull away from school more altogether to some of the studies I've read. Yeah, I know a lot of people in the junior grade who uh, are kind of like overwhelmed by, or somewhat overwhelmed by the homework that they have and they prefer to work so they work and they don't do their homework and I think that issue would get, would be exacerbated, or could be, you should just consider, yeah. could be exacerbated by this. Yeah. No, I think, I think they're good points. Uh, I want to add, like, there's also in lower income areas where the kids have to take care of their siblings after school and or they have to take care of their parents after school. Um, so, and some of those kids aren't doing their homework in the first place, mm -hmm. so they're probably more than likely not gonna do that extra homework because it sets you up to be like, well, I can't hit this expectation, so maybe mm -hmm. I shouldn't just hit this at all. Whereas the other kids who are in their classes doing their homework, they're probably gonna have and I've seen studies on this, and we've had to have discussions with this where your mental health is important, and you're stressing out about getting this homework done because you do your homework, and this added load that you don't really need, you're just getting because your teachers are telling you to, adds to the more mental health side of the kids who actually do their homework. Um, and to add on to that, um, adding extra homework kind of assumes that kids have a space at home to do that work uninterrupted and undistracted, where um, like not all kids have those undistracted things. Like if we think, I'm not, I don't want to put this as a classes. Uh, this is gonna come up. No, and I'm just, classes, I'm just, I'm just taking notes but, um, just to make sure I'm like got people catching. stable. Kids with stable homes, mm -hmm. um, even they don't actually have sometimes places to actually do the work. But kids with stable homes are the ones who are probably doing like the after school sports, who are doing these other things, and this is going to impact them that way. But kids, and I think we have a really high free, free or reduced lunch rate uh, dep in dep this. Yeah, depends these on three the schools. <coughs> so, again, not to some classes, but usually in those situations, those are the kids that have, like, that have to have a job, that have to take care of the siblings, that have to take care of their parents. Um, they don't have, like, how do you, how are those kids going to have a good place to actually do their work and study when they probably don't even have a place to eat dinner? Like, their dinner is maybe on the room or on the floor, because those are real situations mm -hmm. that we have. And then one more thing. Um, if you have a child that has an IEP that needs accommodations um, and they may or may not have support from their parents on those accommodations, how does that work? Because like, if you have a kid that 
um, has difficulty reading or writing, they usually have a scribe, you know, or a speech to text. Um, how does that work with their 20 minutes where one kid can read one paragraph for 20 minutes and not get anywhere? Where another kid could probably zoom through a book in 20 minutes. Um, so, like, how does that get timed, and how does that um, how does that get worked out? I know my child's graduating, but we had those accommodations too, um, and I just I would just worry about the I don't know if I want to call it the economy of scale to it, where if teachers have to give up this 20 minutes, even if their class doesn't need it, but they have to give up these 20 minutes every day. Where do they get that individualized control to be like, well, my classroom is ahead, and I have a whole, you know, five or six stress buckets right now, and they can't handle this right now. They have other things to do. I just hope that the teachers have, can, they don't lose their autonomy and their control over, now I'm just, I'm, I've read that you're supposed to, um, uh, you know, it's supposed to be high foundation and high quality. Um, but I work for the government too. I get statutes from the state telling me this has to be this and that. But then when you actually have to fulfill it, it's not what the statute says on paper. And I don't know what the means and metrics are for the teachers to do that. And especially if they have IEP or 504 plans. Like, I just don't want to see that. Local so, control. So are there are there questions in there? Because there's yes. a lot of pieces that. Can, yeah, sorry. I you, you asked a lot of them, so it's it, it start start so me the, off. The with, question is the. I, I actually have my inequality. Yeah. Maybe. So to kids who have access to stable homes or calm homes versus kids who don't, I guess is the first question. So, so the goal, overall goal, and then there are some structures that, that we have planned for next year to try to accommodate for that. And they may not be yeah. the best, and if, if not, we, we learn and we, we adjust. Um, but in terms of for the older students, you know, the work should be at a level that they can do. So that's the first piece, it, without ass assistance, you know, from, from parents at home. That is it's not how these matters work, personally. So hold on Sorry. here. I, please let me, please let me okay. speak. And I will agree with you, they may not be working that way now, but that just means that the other piece of this is we have to have clear expectations for the teachers in terms of how things are delivered. There are a couple of really important points that she brought up. And again, the, my, my answer may not be satisfying, but I'll, I'll give you the thought process that went there. Um, so that, that's the first piece. At the, the lower grade levels, it gets a little bit more difficult, right? Especially at the, the, uh, the, the, the lower um, elementary grades where, you know, the interactions with the parents, um, you know, are, are going to be key. And it's a good thing if those interactions happen because a lot of the, the work that those students are doing are developing socialization, and the best way to do that is in the family unit, if, if, if at all possible. So at the lower level, um, we do and expand upon kind of what we've been doing now, which is the, the parent nights, to have the parents come in, we'll, we'll serve them dinner, we'll talk a little bit about how to interact with the students in ways that, that will be helpful, um, that will support you know, the homework, and the homework is different there, and the homework may not be the best word. Like I said, it might be, okay, here's a, here's a, a math board game that we will supply to you. you know, can you take this home and spend you know, 10 minutes a night playing with the kids? Um, you know, those sorts of expectations, and then you know, we spend the night kind of going through the, uh, and playing the game that night so that the parents are comfortable and familiar with it, and we can talk about you know, what it is that the students are learning by doing this. Um, at the high school level, we built in, and this was to support uh, some of the other concerns that came up, we built in um, the after-school busing. Um, to help so the students that needed to stay, you know, after for a couple, half hour, whatever it is, to, to get some help and get caught up. They have the ability to do that. But also the other concern that we had was that we want to get more of the students involved in extracurricular activities. You know, whether it's sports or whether it's the, you know, the drama program or, or, or the various other programs that we have here. And a lot of them haven't been able to do that because they don't have that ride. And so that's the, the other purpose behind that. So trying to be able to meet those, those pieces with providing what's basically a $70,000 cost for the year, which is cheap compared to the budget, um, to kind of fill in those, those, those spaces. Um, in terms of, and this comes back to the idea of the extra, 
Um, homework, the goal isn't to say, you know, everybody's got 30 minutes of homework a night or an hour of homework a night. And it, it's not, not to provide extra. The goal is uh, for the teachers uh, to identify with the new testing systems that we have. Um, folks have been through STAR 360. Um, some folks have probably had track, track my progress testing. Um, it identifies where the weak skills are in terms of the students. Um, some of those skills are, are weak because we need to improve the activities that we're using to teach our kids. You know, the activities, they're doing activities with the kids, but they may not be as effective as they need to be. So some of the, those changes can happen. But those um, testing modules are important because when we pick the specific pieces of homework that we feel are the most important, because they really get the kids to, to learn the foundational standards that they need. Not everything has to be learned really well. You have to be familiar with a lot of stuff. Some stuff you just need to have down pat. Um, we can actually use the testing results to tell us if that homework was effective at promoting what it was that we wanted it to accomplish. And if it doesn't, we go and we change it until we find the right, the, the right mix of pieces. Yeah. To go back to a part of that perspective that wasn't fully addressed. Yeah. My personal experience with the school it, it has not been the standard one. I am considered to be a twice exceptional student who struggles with dyslexia, and in those struggles I have consistently found that I've, I've taken classes of all levels. I may, I've been in APs and I've been in lower level courses, and in my experience, the teachers who attempt to have steady, consistent homework have had the least time or been willing to do the least in order to meet make accommodations or look into the, this work and oftentimes when I struggled most in classes because of my dyslexia was in the standardized regular formatted work because in those cases the teachers give out so much of it that they can't in, like look at it from an individual basis or case to case basis. Additionally some of the like my the classes are some of the more highest performing classes like higher level courses, such as AP classes, which are striving the whole year to meet a set goal, such as phys AP Physics or AP Lit, the two I am in currently, mm -hmm. provide less homework. And even AP Physics, which is widely considered one of the highest level high school courses, mm -hmm. if you look at the AP test in grad like testing results and scores, does not provide standard homework because the teacher knows who, is what, who has been like, pushing us quickly the whole year to the extent that We've all been there for most projects. Hasn't been giving regular homework in AP Lit. There hasn't been regular homework because oftentimes that is not what's necessary for learning, and it would just cause further stress and duress in some of our already challenging courses. Additionally, the lack of support that one can see at home if they struggle with a learning disability is a vastly different environment than what they can do at school. With, if they don't have, say, parents helping them with reading or navigating a complicated source or site, your productivity goes down by a massive factor. It's, it's almost, it becomes almost impossible to do in an hour what you could do in 10 minutes at school at times. So you, you had a lot of parts and pieces in there. The, the, the very beginning one, which I, I agree with you wholeheartedly on, is it's not about adding extra. It's about finding out the, the key pieces that are really important um, and making sure that there's homework that's tied to that. So you might actually, in a lot of your classes, might find a reduction if they do this process the way that it is supposed to go. AP is a different animal. Um, I do know that, especially with like uh, the AP Physics, I know the students do come in and put an extra time above and beyond because she makes herself available for that work. Um, and so that's kind of taking the place um, of, of what would normally be homework. She's there and she's available. I'm in AP Physics and, it, and that work isn't usually treated in, in that way at all. But, addition, but what if it's which way? By how it isn't usually you're given the work you would be given as homework in class. So the entire class time is usually spent on understanding the concepts more than blanket like work, which is what is necessary. But that's besides my main point. My main point is whether it is intended to be in addition to or in replacement of other work. 
if someone struggles with a learning dif difference or if they struggle with a home system, what would be a, a small amount of work that they could bang out in five minutes at school could take hours at home or, mm -hmm. and cause huge problems. So with a, with a, a student who's on an IEP, Typically what happens in those cases is the team gets together and they either modify or they accommodate for that extra work. Which works in so class. That doesn't let, happen with let, let, let me finish and then I'm happy to connect so that, because otherwise I get lost in the... Yes. Uh, okay. so, so typically what would happen if, if the burden is something that a student couldn't do, then the IEP would be changed to accommodate for that or to modify the curriculum so that it is something that they could do. With the after-school component as well, as students would be able to have access to those specialized support services to be able to get that, that help at that time. In reality, what happens, I have four years of experience in this system, is in those situations, the student doesn't get extra help or extra assistance in this class. They're sent to a lower level class that's usually below their ability level. Yep. You could be fully capable, but that isn't what happens. And that is not the route that I have ever seen taken either with myself or with any other student I know with similar struggles. What you're saying would be ideal, but I've never t taken place to we, my We haven't tried to implement this yet. No, but I'm taking, there are a few classes that use a similar system of standardized, vectorized mm -hmm. homework, such as Ms. Drown's AGS-3 or, or a few others I, I've taken earlier, where teachers have standardized and set, this class will have this much homework at night. And that's always the classes where these issues arise. So you're saying that when we put this new policy in place, if, if a student has an IEP or like a learning difference that sets them apart from other students, uh, work will be done so that they will get support at home more than is now to help them doing this. At, at home, after school, and or like I said, a modification. So there, there's accommodations and modifications. Accommodations, probably the best way to explain it is, you know, this is, this is how we're going to help um, develop strategies so that, that students can help themselves. Modifications are a little, little bit bigger. Um, you know, if there's additional homework or there's additional work um, that the student is able to do, but because they might process a little bit differently might take them longer to do than those assignments would be modified or eliminated if, 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 if they're not felt that they're completely um, needed. But again, that gets us back to the idea of quality. If they're not completely needed, then they shouldn't be a homework assignment anyway. And there will be training for the parents, you said. Training that has the parents and, and the teachers because it, it's, it's going to be potentially a new role for them as well. Yeah, because parents, unprepared parents, even almost, unprepared parents when dealing with a learning difference that they don't understand or agree with or know, can, that can cause a lot of frustration, yelling, you know, like, it, it can be bad for the child to experience unprepared parents with their learning differences. Yeah. No, uh, 100 hundred percent, hundred percent agreed. But the training for the parents is important. What what I found, um, and it's not true in all cases. You know, we, we, we shoot to try to help as many folks as we can. Is that uh, we have a lot of parents at the elementary level that really do mean well for their students, but they just don't know how to do it. Yeah. And that's why that that training piece is is very very key. But I think um, that that is parenting. <laughs> uh, so, so some people, you know, grew up in a different sort of household, and you know, they can they can model, you know, you know what they grew up with as well. Some some parents don't have that, and they mean, and they, they really that. don't know. And so the the being able to sit down and have those conversations and have those little trainings with them can can make a lot of difference. Yeah. So it's it's a good 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 questions. Other thoughts that that folks have. Um, I mean, so you said Braintree for just about all grades has had like 20 minutes of homework. Um, is that like a night or a week? That's typically nightly. Nightly. Um, That's 20 minutes eight. per class. I have a little brother. Um, he's been going to Braintree for three years. Um, and for reading class, he's 20 minutes of optional reading homework. It's not required. 
Um, I think sometimes he has math homework, but I think most of the time he's asked for it from the teacher. Other than that, I haven't heard of any homework he's ever had. And it's, it's not 20 minutes per class, it's 20 minutes total. 20 minutes total per night. Per night, okay. yeah, across all classes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no, again, and again, I'm not, I, I, I'm not a proponent of 20 minutes every night. Um, I'm a proponent of these are the, the 15 standards of the, the 400 that you've got to learn in the class that are critical uh, that you need to understand um, both to build on in future classes but to really understand the paradigm behind which the class is taught under. And so those are the ones that you would support with the extra work to make sure that the, the students have those things down pat. Um, and it's one of the things that, that I've, I've noticed over the time here is that the students actually learn really well in the classroom. Um, but what seems to happen is they forget it pretty quickly. And so when you see a pattern of that, so in terms of, right, they'll, they'll learn it, they'll do well on the project, they'll do well on the work in the class for this week. But when they have to go back and, and uh, do that same performance, when they get on the SBAC, here are your, your high school scores in, in math. It's not there. And it's not that they didn't learn it at the time. That, that I am sure of. I've seen some, some very high quality teaching. Um, but when you don't have that rehearsal, uh, to have to go back and, and kind of rethink through the key concepts, that, that retention gets lost. And then it becomes very hard to um, pull up the information you need when you need it. I might be misunderstanding or misinterpreting you, but I think that this suggests that the problem is something other than the lack of homework. Because in math, uh, math classes for I think we can agree you're going to make a really this. good you're going to make a really good good point if you follow it all the way through to the end. So continue saying what you're saying. Yeah, I was. What I was saying was we can all agree that math classes uh, are probably assigning us the most consistent nightly mm -hmm. homework. Okay. okay, so we are getting homework regularly from math classes. And I think we can see here that the um, students are not retaining uh, what they're being taught in class. So to go back to the original discussion um, with John Hattie when he did his research, okay. his homework for the sake of homework is pointless. Okay, true. Quality homework that's tied in producing results, which we can, you know, we get the assignments, we can see how the students did and decide if it actually had the impact that it was supposed to in terms of student learning, that makes a difference. So one of the, the arguments that you could make here is, yeah, they're giving you lots of homework, but obviously it's not having the desired impact, is it? That, so again, that's, you're on a really good, a really good thought path there. Um, but quality, quality homework, and that's the, the theme that runs through this, this idea, is what's key. Randolph, as it appears to be, seems to be a challenging teaching environment as based on the high turnover rate of staff recently. Do you th and the but relatively no I can I can talk about it because our, our turn I can tell you exactly what our turnover rate is and it is not high compared to what's been going on around okay. the state because it has <clears throat> seen in these last few years a lot more faculty have, from all perspective in high school have seemed to leave but my, my wider point yep. I believe still stands that the uh, you're asking for the homework to be higher quality and the work to be higher quality but mandating a set amount Will, I don't believe will increase the quali individual quality of the homework, especially with our already strained teachers with a lot of new teachers and a lot of the more senior teachers I know and have spoken to teaching many, many classes. So, so the, the, again, we're not, we're not advocating a standard amount every night. We're advocating that where it's appropriate, which is typically foundational standards and what we call targeted standards, that's where the homework would come in. In terms of turnover rates, um, prior to COVID, our turnover rate was about 12%. The state average is, is, is between 14 and 18. Oh, and I'll go, to, I'll go to what happened during COVID as well. Um, during COVID, the state average was anywhere, depending upon the region that you were in, between 20 and, and 50%, um, especially the last year that COVID was in place. Um, ours never got above about 18. Between no. last school year and this school year, what was the turnover rate between staff? The last one I have not, but it's it's less than it was during COVID. It's probably back down to around the norm. RTCC, the tech centers had a very high turnover rate, but in terms of the general district, I was not. I was referring less to like total turnover rate. 
that I know like a lot of senior teachers between this last year and this year, and I know many more who are leaving after this, several more who are leaving after this year, that like the teachers who had experience and who had been more senior in the community are the ones who have been leaving. I was more referring over the last two years in particular. Yeah, again, I'm a, I'm a data person, so I, I'll have to disagree a little bit. Okay. Um, I also know who has put in to leave for the coming year so far. There may be others that, that have not, you know, stated, you know, what they're doing, but there, there, there are not, not too many right now. Okay. So yeah. just to clarify, so you're saying it's not a, a set amount of homework every no, night per class. It's to improve the quality of, because uh, I feel like there's a lot of confusion in that, that it mm -hmm. seemed like at previous meetings it was kind of, or maybe I haven't read through this whole thing, but the theory that there's a couple of big asterisks in there that were really like, important. okay, so and there's going to be a certain amount of homework in every core class every night, and I think that's the, I think most people are not opposed to homework, and most people are probably not opposed to improving the homework so that it's of quality and yeah. it's meaningful to the students. It was the the idea of a mandatory amount per night in every core class mm. that seemed like it was not going to... No, what I, what I had done, and I, I tried it, and maybe I didn't state it very well, I did put a couple of asterisks, so I, I put the little grid in there of what the, high, the highest performing schools in the country are doing. They have policies where there is a specific amount that they expect, which I do not agree with. Um, but one of the reasons that I put that in there was to provide a, a talking point, and that's this, is that one of the primary things that this sort of work does, it extends time on learning. And so if you look at one of those high-performing schools, assuming that, they are, that, that what they are requiring is, is uh, high-quality homework, those students are actually experiencing probably two to three times as much time on learning because of that than students, say, here at our RUHS. How does RHS compare to that school in other respects? How do the students' home environments and ability to focus on learning outside of school compare to those schools? Uh, Belmont High School, I, we had a high poverty rate um, there as well. We had the similar here, um, there wasn't much of a middle class. You had the group that was extremely wealthy, and then you know we were right next to Cambridge and had a lot of students that were coming in from Cambridge that were. From, from families that were food insecure and... These are high-performing schools? Highest performing in the nation, yeah. And so the, the goal isn't to make us the high perform, highest performing school in the nation, but the goal is to take a couple of the, the, the pieces that might be beneficial and see if it can help. Because this, and again, this is not a criticism of, of, of the faculty and staff because they've actually, they've actually slowly been kind of improving stuff a little bit here. Uh, they're back up, you know, they, they, they went through uh, COVID, they're back up to above where they were before COVID, so they've been, been learning and growing in terms of their connections with the staff, but this isn't acceptable um, in terms of, of where they are. You know, they, they should, at, at a minimum, they should be somewhere, you know, four, 48 to 53%, that's about where the state is, so that's where they should, should be at. Um, prior to 2017, um, if you go back and you take a look at the percentages that were meeting proficiency, you know, 18%, 11%, they were historically only 11% of the students out of the high school were hitting proficiency in mathematics. So even though these scores are still low, they've improved quite a bit. They've almost tripled. You know, there's other ways to look at it too. But no, that, that needs to be much better than it is. Okay. And you guys may have other ideas too yeah. that, than homework that might, might help this. Well, what besides homework are we also doing to improve these scores? Because homework might not be your only piece. No. So uh, a, a part of it as well um, is that a couple of cabinet meetings, because the, the pieces all tie together, is okay, you know, are, are, are the teachers, how are, what are they doing with the work that they're receiving from <coughs> the students? Are they grading it? And when they grade it, are they using it to provide meaningful feedback to the students so that they can grow? If the students are deficient on something that's really, really important for them to learn, are they required to redo that work to make sure that it's up to par and up to standards so that we're not sending an unintended message that this work isn't important? Oh, it was different. I'm sorry, like, what on top of, like, where are the other metrics? Besides okay. homework. 
to improve these scores? So the first piece is, is just what we're talking yeah. about, is making sure that the, the teachers are providing feedback. They're actually collecting a tremendous amount of data. But when we took a look at what they were doing with it, a lot of it was being used to inform their own instruction in general. They were not providing a lot of feedback to the students and using it to kind of revamp, oh, you know what, you, you did really, really poorly on, on this piece and this is really critical, so let's have you come in and let's have you sit down and, and make sure that, that you really understand this concept. And so that's a, a part of the expectation piece that would go along with this is, okay, there are some ways that we can interact with the students um, that we should be interacting with the students um, that can help. Uh, there should also be a regular assessment cycle um, because it plays into the, the idea of what they call distributive practice. So it's kind of like um, it's kind of like learning a sport, right? You practice um, today, you, you put in your anywhere from your 20 minutes to your two hours and then tomorrow you go and you do it again and you're putting in that time and your skills improve over time. They improve over time for a couple of reasons. Um, one, because you're stressing the neurons in your brain when, when you do that. When you go to sleep at night, the neurons rearrange themselves to the new skills that you've learned, and then you, you stress them again the next day. You get a little bit more rearrangement, and you, you codify, you really strengthen what those connections are so that those skills really become burned in. That's the rehearsal piece I'm talking about when we, we, we talk about what students are learning. If they only hit it once and maybe do a little project on it, they're going to have a, a fair understanding of the concept, but it might not be retained. And more importantly, they'll have difficulty pulling it back into their mind when they need to use it. Um, so the purpose of, of, of a regular sort of assessment cycle, and assessments don't have to be tests or quizzes, um, is to do what they call distributed practice. You learn it here. Tonight, you do a little bit more of it. You go away from it for a week or two. That concept comes back up again, and you know, in the old days, it was in your chapter test at the end of the week or every two weeks. It comes up again in your midterm, and it comes up again in your final. And it was doing that because it was increasing the time over which the students were encountering your information again and again, because that's what the research shows makes the changes in the brain that causes the retention, so that the information is there. You can draw it up when you need it, and you can draw it up in, in multiple environments when you need it. Um, so without that rehearsal, that's a piece that's missing, and I think that's a big component of, 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 of what's happening here. Yeah, go ahead. So quality homework here is described, you know, that seems to be what pretty much the main focus of this yep. new system is going to be. Quality homework, I mean, there's relevance, and then there's quality. And quality says it requires students to practice a skill or knowledge that they have just learned in order to increase fluency and attention. That makes sense require students to engage in thought or practice skills at a level that's at the edge of their current ability, which also makes sense. So if like we have a math class and we learn how to factor binomials in that math class and then we are assigned homework on it, how the homework would look this year is you have to do those problems. You have to factor binomials, you're doing the thing that you learned in class. So with this system in place, how would that look different? So, uh, and again, not necessarily here, but how it would look different in some of the schools I've been in. Why would a teacher assign you 50, 50 problems to do tonight for homework when three or four could have gotten the point across if they were carefully selected? Right. When, when I, I did, went through my, my math program, um, I could tell, you know, I'd have four or five problems a night. Each one I could tell as I did the problems was carefully selected to illustrate a concept or to make sure that I didn't miss something important, right? They weren't chosen at random. There was a purpose behind, behind the choices and the choosing to kind of reinforce those skills. And so that's the, the key piece. You know, if you're getting homework every, every night and, you know, you're getting, you know, you gotta, you gotta do your 20 problems every night, that's probably not a, the best way to do it. Um, if you're getting two or three carefully selected problems that require you to think through the things that we covered in class today as the reinforcement, right? Stress the neurons in, in the class, you had some, some consolidation time for the neurons to kind of rearrange themselves a little bit and you stress them again with the homework, you're going to make some real benefits. Right. That makes sense. If that makes sense. The other piece I think that's important in there that's a little bit further on is the idea of like we were talking, the foundational and the targeted. So foundational standards are, 
math is a, is a key example. If I don't learn this in Algebra 1, I'm not going to be able to do Algebra 2 successfully. And everything that I learn in Algebra 1, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to be, be familiar with a lot of it, but there are probably only six or seven standards <coughs> of everything that you learn that is critical, that if you don't have them under your belt, you're not going to be successful in your next math class in line. So foundational standards is an area that we would target for this, this rehearsal process. Targeted standards, don't lose your thought if you got one. Targeted standards are a little bit different. Targeted standards are the teachers have gone through the assessment data for the year and they realize that there are three or four areas where despite best efforts, the students really aren't learning at the level we need or we want them to. And so we would target those um, as well where the teachers uh, at the beginning of the year would identify what those targeted standards are. They would sit down and create new learning activities right then and there as their, their teacher group on those, those professional development days so that they're ready to deliver those activities when those concepts come up during the year. And those would have homework tied to them as well because we want to raise students' knowledge on those targeted standards. So go ahead. Sounded like you had a thought. I have a question on the same point, Will. Yeah. In my experience in the school, which I'll admit it has not been this standard one I often would go straight from the lowest level in the subject to the highest. Mm -hmm. But when old metrics have been covered, they've been covered from a fresh perspective and like you've basically redone the work. I've come into almost all of my highest level classes without having taken any other class in the subject. I have many AP Lit without having taken an English class. I skipped until AGS 3 in math, not from like jumping ahead, but from just never having the opportunity to take the lower level options until I was at the grade level to take GS3 and then going from that to, to, from, to, from that to physics. And there has not once been a time when a concept was introduced and not taught in, the, in class in that, in that perspective, even when it really w hasn't been necessary in the students all seem to understand a concept. Uh, the teachers in here and they don't know exactly what was covered by the previous teacher, so therefore every thing or every core idea has had to be recovered anyway. Oh. So I think, I think I'm understanding a, a, a little bit, so I apologize and you can steer, steer me right. Um, typically with the, with the AP classes, with a few exceptions, um, it is best to have the standard class first and then take the AP. Um, and that's right from the AP and right from the AP research with the exception of a few courses, biology. Um, AP <coughs> biology is one that you know, students can take the first time around. Um, some of the social studies and some of the history AP courses they can as well. But like uh, the AP physics, um, especially if you're taking calculus-based AP physics, um, the expectation is, is that you've taken the, a standard you know, high school physics course before you've done it because it introduces those concepts that you then rehearse and build upon when you get to the AP class. Uh, uh, and our scores, um, because we don't do that, our AP scores are is probably one of the reasons that they're so low. Well. That was not my point. I okay, just sorry used, about that. I just used the APs as an example of it being true at a higher level. But my wider point, it, and without that background, I've been... I haven't like felt like I've missed anything in those APs, even when compared to the background the other students have. But my wider point was, I went from no no proper math class to like AGS three basically, for example, or and did the same in several other subjects because I came to school in ninth grade as a homeschooler and only then part time. But personally, I've never once run into a subject in which prior knowledge from a previous class would have been necessary if you, they, were, they reteach everything every year anyway. And the few times I've seen it teach, yeah, without exception in my experience in this high school, so even see, in the more successful classes. So what I hear you saying is that they reteach it prior to having... They, they even have to bring in information that you learned in a previous class that you took that whatever their expectation is for you in that class, they're going to teach, gonna, they're, they're gonna teach you what, what should have happened earlier. 
because and so do, do we see like do we see do we see a problem with that? No, but the, the the source of it is a lack of internal communication. It appears to be agreed more than a lack of the knowledge being taught, and maybe that should be a focus more on coordinating between teachers rather than in enforcing those discussions and meetings between the teacher who taught the previous grade and then the class that they're picking up instead of an increased emphasis on and policing of the work that's sent home with the students. So some of the, the structural work that was done this year um, that made its way up to the high school was that the teachers were heavily engaged in creating their curriculums. Um, so the curriculum is all the concepts and skills and standards that, that they'll be teaching to the students in their courses. And one of the reasons that they do that is so that they can provide the proper tiering as students move from grade to grade so that they're getting the proper foundation in grade 7 so that it doesn't have to be retaught in grade or taught in grade 8 before you can move on to the grade 8 curriculum. So that work was, was, uh, has happened over the course of this year behind the scenes. In, in ELA, in math, um, social studies is working on it. They're, they're a little bit farther behind because they're starting from scratch a little bit more. Um, in, especially in terms of the assessment side of things. But fine, fine arts is working on it and science is working on it. And so that is going to address that, that piece that you're talking about, which is really important. Because, yeah, they just frankly don't know what was yeah. taught in the previous. And so and you bring up a really good point because the, um, the idea of identifying what the foundational standards are, how it works is if I'm the sixth grade math teacher and you're the fifth grade math teacher, we sit together, I look at your curriculum, and I say that standard, that standard, that standard, and that standard are your foundational ones. I really need you to make sure the kids have those down pat before they come to me in sixth grade. It's not obvious what you expect to, to know when you're in a class because yeah. like, even without previous knowledge, everything is still post fresh. Yeah. Yeah, no good combo. Yes, Beth? You talked about um, like a parent um, session. Help the parents, and I think if we implement a homework um, policy, I feel like there needs to be something for executive function or yep. um, study skills for the students. Because mm -hmm. I feel like mm -hmm. I have a senior who's has done AP classes. And yep. I feel like when he hit the AP level, and there was a lot of homework that he didn't have much, yeah. or he would do homework yeah. at school. He hard, very rarely brought home homework. My kindergartner was doing more homework than my ninth grader. Um, mm -hmm. That that piece was missing. Mm -hmm. AP kind of hit him like, oh wow, this is like, I'm not prepared for this level of studying. And, and I now have a ninth grader who is kind of feeling that same way, like I wasn't prepared for this level of homework that I'm seeing now. So I feel like the kids really need some study skills. So the, uh, the life mm -hmm. skills program that I sent the email out on mm -hmm. uh, that we had talked about, that is a major component of it. Um, and it's critical. Um, the life skills program, um, will start out in kind of a, a fledgling um, format next year, but it will end up being kind of a mandatory course for most students. Do you know what level it's gonna be at? Uh, I gotta talk with, with Deb Larry. Um, she's the original instructor. I do have enough funding to potentially bring on a second instructor, which we're trying to figure out. Um, it, students should be touching on it probably at least three of their years at the high school. Um, because given the the different things that the community felt was important for students to, to, to learn and know from it. The um, executive functioning skills, right? how do I study, mm -hmm. um, how do I prepare, um, being one of them. Um, it should be kind of divvied up. There should be one during the transition year when you come over, right? and that's where the study skills piece should happen. Um, there should be one that happens probably in ninth grade and another that happens in 11th, depending upon which the skills you know, they're learning. And so the, it will be a pretty comprehensive program. It's just going to take a couple of years to build it up to where it needs to be. So if we're going to implement this earlier, I just feel like that maybe it has to be at grade level or even individual class level just to give the kids, like, what does studying look like? What, yep. What's this homework yeah. really doing? And it should be happening in the transition year because the expectations on the students, um, they typically, there's a couple of grades that they typically um, change considerably. It's typically grade four and grade seven. Um, and so those are critical years to, to really make sure that the students have those skills that they're carrying with them. I know my kids, yeah. that are, once they hit ninth, and then when they hit the APs and 11th, those are two kind yeah. of really big, like, whoa, it feels different. Well, well, one of the issues is, is kind of what we talked about a little bit here with the AP, is a lot of those AP courses, they are not 
they are college level courses. So the expectation is, is that you took it in high school before you took it in college. And so when we don't double up that way, um, we're not serving those kids and they're not, they're going to get knowledge out of the AP course, but they're not going to get as much as they could because they don't have that foundation to build on. They can't make the connections with their, their internal frameworks and have the pieces for the way they should. How come there's um, no middle class? No, is it a, is there a reason why there's no like honors? Like you yeah. go from Size. regular English to honors English to AP because there's that, that middle piece. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a good. Or honors, math, you know, like you're missing those high-level classes that don't necessarily have to be AP to give them the students yeah. that same. So, and, and the students can probably t t tell how well this worked or in this case didn't work. Um, small schools, it's hard because you don't have as many sections to be able to dedicate to kind of differentiating those courses that way. So one of the things a couple of years ago when the state required us to move over to um, graduation proficiencies and standards-based report cards. Um, one of the things that they tried to do, and I don't think it was, was successful, so it needs to be revisited, is they said, okay, um, based upon this, you know, if you go into your eighth grade math course, here are the standards that you have to master to be considered passing the course. Here are the standards that you have to master to be considered at the honors level. Here are the standards you have to master to be considered mm -hmm, at the mm -hmm. honors level. So they, they, they made an attempt to try to do that differentiation, but within a class with, with all the students in it. And so you guys can tell me how that worked, or if you're even aware that they were doing that. When was this? So this, uh, this started probably the year before COVID. I mean, I was in eighth grade, like, this I, didn't really, uh, I, I don't think I was able to even experience this. Is, I, I, did that carry over into the sortings of the pods during COVID? Uh, because I think that did not go well. Because yeah, no. Um, yeah, so may, maybe we don't have enough data yet to tell. But that, that, was the, that was the attempt at that time, and, and I'm trying to remember the timelines because it all mashes together now. I think, it, I think you have it right. I think it got blown out of the water a little bit because of the COVID piece. But yeah. that was the attempt is, okay, you know, these are all the possible standards to, to pass the class and, and be considered to have, you know, have the, the general knowledge of somebody who took Algebra two. this is what you need to know. If you're at the honors level, these are the additional standards, and if you're at the high honors, and, and so that was how they were, were trying to differentiate. So would there have been like three different math classes at that point? This one same, class. same math class, but if you were on the honors, if you were shooting for honors, you had additional learning that you had to accomplish before the course was over to earn that honors designation. Now, I'm not saying it was a good system. I'm saying that's what the right. high So it would appear trying. differently on your transcript, even though you were in the same class. Yeah. So if you and I were in the same class and you did the honors track, it would say that on your transcript. Right. Okay, so you know, if you're in calculus, you know, oh, if you've learned how to integrate, you you you're, you're you've passed calculus. But if you learn how to integrate and differentiate, you know, you're an honors student. So there's a little bit additional learning. This is harking back to your previous study system. I'd like to make one suggestion. Yep. We got. It. I believe it would make more sense rather than having. Miss Larry teach this course because she's already started to teach general things and I believe I can speak for most students when I say I don't believe she'd be particularly well qualified for that course based on classroom experience as if you guys uh, yeah. agree. Yeah, no, he's right. But um. rather there is in the like special ed support department a number of people who are, have direct experience in teaching those same executive functioning skills, both the people who have struggle and learn differently in that way, but also those who learn differently in other ways. And so they know how to teach it both to the general student as well as the person who might be struggling with those skills. As well as being there being a vast number of the faculty in this area who are all familiar with different grade levels and different grade levels expectations and where people start to fall behind in this, these subjects. Whereas Miss Larry has a particularly negative track record in this specific regard according to my experience and the experience of anyone I've ever talked to who has taken one of her classes. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, and 
make actually teach I don't even. Things. I don't know if this is where this should even be brought up about how this. No, but it's something we can talk about yeah. privately if there there are concerns. Because if there are, we always we always do an investigation, take a look at things. So uh, yeah. I do have one more thing on the um, sure. homework policy. Um, I feel like when it says that homework was should be graded and returned in a timely manner, I feel like obviously you're not going to set some specific time. But the experience that my kids have had in high school is that they are not getting their work returned yeah. to them. Mm -hmm. um, we've brought it up at community meetings many times as far as um, just for us, for Schoology, um, got to the point where we've actually kind of given up checking it because we've had experiences where grades from November were still not in in February. So my concern is that kids were not receiving feedback, because if they're not receiving feedback, they're not learning. Yeah. Um, whether it's positive or negative or either way, if you're just doing the assignment, it becomes busy work. So um, it has improved some since we've you know, really checked and checked and checked um, and checked in with our kiddos, but I still feel like Schoology is not serving the purpose. It hasn't been Schoology for two years. Right, the new the new system. The new system, yeah. Um, um, yeah, it's, it changes every year. Yeah, yeah and yeah, I think that's part of the problem for a while. We were looking at the wrong one because they were both still active, but yeah. we, we got yeah. that sorted yeah. out. Um, but still having trouble finding up to date grades. It, yes. You know, they all go in yes. like the week before school, but then that doesn't give the kids an opportunity to like reflect on what they did for work, what they need to improve or change, and where the learning actually happens. Um, so I think for the homework policy as well. Like if it's not, if it's going to be effective and not just be busy work and needs to be returned so that the kids can no. learn from it. No, and an agreement, and, and again, you hit on a bunch of pieces. So, so this is, as building this, it's a system that pieces that have to fit together. So one of them is, you know, establishing the policy, taking the concerns and the ideas that came here, um, melding those, those into it. Um, the other piece, and again, this is a failure of the district over time, is making the expectations clear with the teachers, you know, what does it mean to provide, you know, feedback to students? Because they're doing amazing work, but if we're not providing the expectation and, and showing them what it looks like, that's on us. And so one of the pieces for the strategic planning um, session that's coming up this uh, summer <coughs> where the admin get together is a revamp of the faculty and student handbook so that those expectations are in there and then that's what we talk with the faculty about when they first get back to school to really kind of to push that. Um, the, the Schoology piece, um, they're going to be nixing it. It, was, it did not do what it was promised to do. Um, but that's okay. They, they, they learned something. But what was interesting about the discussion is that when we went and we were taking a look at the teachers' grade books, you know, we were trying to see, you know, are they giving feedback to the students or what are they doing with the data because they're collecting a lot. Um, most of them were just handwriting it into either uh, their own little paper grade books or they were putting it in Excel spreadsheets. And, that's what, I think and then they would transfer it over when they had time into Schoology. Right. And so then it's like, okay, so why, why? That seems really inefficient to yeah. me. So yeah. if that's the case, then maybe we need a better, better product. And it's two different things. You know, yeah. parents like to be able to see how their children are doing. But even, you know, we try to push a lot of that on our kids. It's their education. And yeah. they should be, you know, getting the feedback themselves. And that was the more important piece to me. As if, my, you know, my kids were like, oh, I didn't, you know, it's, you know, teachers would come back and say, oh, I should be in Google Classroom. And my kids would go through it and be like, I didn't even know you could check for Google Classroom co comments. And I was like, well, that's a yeah. major problem if you don't know that's where you're supposed to be getting your feedback. Since they're not getting paperback like we did when we were younger that was like, you know, yeah. marked up, it needs to be coming back in some form. Well, there, there, there's uh, a whole other discussion, you know, as we, we were talking about the software piece that, that we've had. And actually, the students might be able to help is what is the value of the Chromebooks? On you want to go first? The, the, I feel the, a, like first off, the I agree with your earlier comment on feedback and mm -hmm. such to Schoology. It has not been a sustainable system. But part of that unsustainability is how it's changed every year, both in that system and in the way the grades are taken. And that yeah. consistent change has made it so no, not only the teachers can't settle into it, but the students can't either, to or parents to really understand what the different things mean or how to put it in. The last year, for example, I, I know it's a few teachers who struggled with that system and because of the struggles of trying to learn new systems slowed it down. So would changing the whole system again necessarily be wise instead of giving teachers time to adapt? 
and on a separate point on the phone books is having a computer is incredibly useful but some of the limitations are overbearing on what the computer can access some are valid but some are of overbearing i have been denied access to historical treatises on war on various wars we're supposed to cover in history because they contain uh battles in them or and the like and also these blockers have slowed the computers down to a point where they crash fre frequently because that's where most of the power is going into so i think maybe having an option of i know there's spare computers setting up a limited blocker computer lab for students to do work on or limiting the blockers themselves in, on the computers that students can take around with them might improve the situation greatly. If we weren't using Chromebooks, and, since the students don't get books or textbooks or English books, <laughs> it seems like lately, um, where would that information well, that, that's, come? How would that information come? So that, that's, that, that was one of the reasons that I think the scores were dropping when I started. Um, when I came in the door, they had been on a long decline. They had made a shift to the Chromebooks, and I want to talk about this a little bit since I've got three users here of them. Um, and when they switched over to the Chromebooks, they just stopped buying textbooks. And one of the things that we've been doing is uh, I've been pulling my hair out a little bit on that because Chromebooks, and this is where you guys can argue with me, so I'm going to make an assertion, doesn't mean I'm right. Chromebooks in computers use what are called browsers. And browsers, by their very name, tell you what they're designed to do. They are designed to have folks skim for information and skim for answers. There is not typically a lot of really deep reading um, and deep thought that goes into the process that occurs between a student and a Chromebook in, in most situations. Um, and so that also impacts retention, and that also impacts critical thinking, and that also impacts learning. Right, if you're going back to study something. And they're just skimming for, yeah, and, and so. And like you said, it's that, no. you were saying earlier about like, you know, doing it, yeah. like practice piece, doing it, they miss that. Yeah, and so, they're, 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 there's that aspect that, that might be a concern depending upon how the teachers are using it. It doesn't have to be that way, but it depends upon whether the plans. But when they, for whatever reason, when they switched to the Chromebooks, they just stopped buying textbooks. And there was no like electronic replacement for them. I get concerned because one of the expectations is that students are able to read technical documents at a high level when they get out of high school. And if you're not required to be reading regularly technical material, like even if it's just a science textbook or a math textbook, then how are you going to get that skill? It's possible if it's if it's well developed with the teachers in the Chromebooks, but I'm not sure if it's happening. The so main I, issue with the Chromebooks isn't the fact that there are Chromebooks are designed to browse. It's that, like I said, the blockers make them incredibly inconsistent, and teachers have no way of knowing what will be allowed and what won't be. So they have to they can't assign anything to, to post because often random stuff that shouldn't be blocked will be, or stuff that may be just because of the catch-all focus in situations where we. To the point where they've had us do our work on our phones instead, at times because computers are just unreliable. If are they not powerful enough? Is it? They're, uh, it's, they're, it's not, they're not powerful enough because they're being used up in these restrictions, in these limitations that keep you from accessing oftentimes deeper sources that go into greater detail because they might have a keyword in them somewhere. Oh, you're saying it's taking up the memory. The blockers are taking up ninety percent of the computer's memory, which are making them unreliable. In addition, and prone to crashes. In addition to random, like websites that really shouldn't be blocked, or just because of such, such a general nature of blockers and, and improvised security makes them almost unusable for research. Like nine, you could re try be trying to research a subject for a history class. Nine, like five to nine of the sources you'll be trying to research will be blocked or web pages, with no clear reason of why. Or, and, or you're trying to find an image or a relevant passage from a book that will probably be blocked. The reason why they, they can't be used is not just because of that, but also because stuff is blocked and the tech team is incredibly so slow at unblocking things for teachers or even with ticket requests or allowing extensions that might help learning. I haven't, I have a 
reader on my computer, but Google Read, right? One of the, what's considered to be one of the least capable and effective voice to text readers that won't work on most PDFs. I have submitted tech tickets to request more advanced readers. I've had the, both the computer science teacher and special ed teacher submit tech tickets for better readers. None have ever been answered. It's the over-restricting of computers, uh, make, preventing students from personalizing some features of the computers by blocking all extensions or all web stores of places to download information, just blocking the entire store. That has made the computers so much less effective than theorized. It, it's been the, the management in that regard and restrictions placed upon the computers rather than the fact that they are on screen. So the, if the, see if I'm understanding, so if the feeling is that if the blo blockers were more selective in what they blocked as opposed to broadband blocking, it would improve? It, it would improve because we cannot access these PDFs of the textbooks in any meaningful way because websites that supply them are often blocked or various apps and information sources are, are blocked so people have stopped even going to them. Are you going to have a physical textbook? Uh, well, we've been, we've, we have been in ELA and math and, and science. We've been revamping that. There's a cost associated yeah. with it, and it's, it's not cheap, but they're, they're good programs that we've been bringing in. Um, but that doesn't mean that the Chromebooks are going away. What, what I saw, and again, it, 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 hopefully it has changed, um, not in all classrooms, but in a lot, was uh, when I was doing my walk-arounds prior to COVID, you go into some classrooms, uh, the teacher would introduce the lesson um, to the students, spend about five minutes telling them what they were doing, and then the, the kids just worked on the Chromebook the whole period. You know? And so, that's what we have I don't know if that's, that's still, still happening as much. I've got my walkthrough actually scheduled for here tomorrow. Um, but you know, that's, that's, I don't know if that's effective. It could be, depending upon how the teacher stru structures it, um, but Wait. it might not be. Yeah. What are you suggesting as opposed to that, like, like doing work on the like, paper? No, um, I mean there should be. You've got a highly qualified, highly skilled person there that should be able to engage with you and, and come up with learning activities that, um, you know, are are, yeah. are are both funny and, and and work with you on those. And there's nothing wrong with using the Chromebooks. Um, you know, when I saw something like that, you know, my first response is I went back and I talked with the tech team and I said, well, jeepers, did the teachers ever get any kind of training on, you know, what good lessons look like if you're going to use a, use a Chromebook for these things? I'm like, no, they just bought them and plopped them, and plopped them down. And so that's not the teacher's fault, that's ours. Yeah. Um, well, I think the uh, Chromebooks are incredibly useful. Um, I mean, they may yeah. be limited a little bit, but being able to look at your grades um, at any point in time or um, being able to finish work and hand it in without having to be in that class it's also really helpful um, but on the grades um, all teachers I, I can't say all but I mean not every teacher I've ever had um, hasn't understood like, they can have the grades they are putting in, but they won't understand the final outcome of the grades. And so... Explain you, that a little more. Um, so, like, um, you can pull up Schoology or PowerSchool, and it will have um, the indicator and the grade you have for that indicator. Yeah. And there will be a bunch of them and all of that. Um, but then when it's turned into a... Um, turned like onto your report card, which is really the, um, the only grading thing I get that I understand, um, except I don't understand it actually. Um, they changed it this year, so I don't understand it yet. But So they take all those grades and then it's stuck through something and it comes out with uh, the grades that are stuck on your report card and those are stuck on your transcript, which is like, those are the grades that really matter. And so, but you, so what you're saying is you're not clear how that translates over from the grading they do on the indicators. Yes. Gotcha. Um, yeah. And nobody really understands that. Um, but then also, like this year, the way um, those grades um, were represented on the uh, report cards were changed. Yeah. Um, 
So like if you were to average them to find your GPA, you have to change it a little bit and it's unclear how to get that. So like seeing, being able to see your grades at any point is helpful, but we can't currently use that. Because it's not understandable. Yeah. So, so the teachers I might say they don't understand it either. It's not just lacking in the students. I've, I've heard teachers complain ab about and say they don't understand quite how the grading system goes in and how final grades work. Uh, so I do don't know if anybody does. Do you, do you find any value whatsoever in the indicators? Um, so and I don't want to... What, what, what indicators? So you, you have your graduation... Right, your the graduation requirements that that your grades are tied to, and you also have this, the standards based grading that, that you call them indicators. So I was using the same term, but the standards that uh, are on your report cards that the teachers are telling you you've met them or you haven't met them at this point in time, is that valuable or not? Like knowing where I am, like how I'm doing it. So class. your report card has a list of you know you should know should know how to solve binomial, should know how to solve. They're not words or names. They're some form of letters and numbers. Oh, so you don't, don't even usually pull them. I'll pull one so, out. So, right yeah, so it's completely. So, is that the new change? Because I haven't seen the new um, change. The new change is usually. Which, it would which have, I haven't seen my son's report card yet. It would have, um, like, the name usually abbreviated. Um, that is what indicator it is or what section of learning it is and you have that grade and then usually you just list those um, but this year as I understand it I, I could be wrong um, is that you have one broader one yep. and then you have multiple under that one and all of those are averaged into that one to say how you did on the broader one yeah yeah and then there's the broader one and all the little ones that are averaged into the broader one and then to get your GPA, I think you average all the broader ones. So there, and so this, I can talk about a discussion um, that I had my first year here. Um, Massachusetts tried to do standards-based reporting 10 years before Vermont got around to it. Um, did not work. Um, it worked at the elementary level, I take that back, but it did not work at the middle and the high school level. Um, when I came in, I talked with the, the administration at this school at the time and said, you know, I read the law, there's a loophole in there. And the loophole goes something like this, is that you have to have graduation proficiencies. But you don't have to spend all your time as you're teaching classes tying everything that you're doing to one graduation proficiency or another. If you do the curriculum work that, that, that we need to do, you can say things simply like this. This graduation proficiency, this graduation proficiency, and this graduation proficiency that we have identified are met if the student has passed Algebra 2 with a B plus or higher. And so you've got the graduation proficiencies defined. You have them tied to where they're taught and where they're assessed, but you don't have to spend hours and hours and hours grading 100 different standards and in proficiencies within a class, and so I wonder if it's time to revisit that conversation with people that might be more willing to listen. Um, I don't know. Would, would, did you guys like the old just A, B, C, or do you get enough? I don't think we've ever had. I don't think they've ever. You had guys may not have. Yeah, they've I'm had sure. a different Folks grading system. Am I right? Like they've had a different. Yeah, grading this system was a, this was a state year. mandate, Since which the they sixth were. Grade, probably. They were. Seventh? Yeah. The, st the state did what it, it typically does, is it says, this is what we want you to do. We're not going to give you a model for how to do it, and, and so that means that uh, the, all the districts across the state all did something different. Yeah, they're just not. I feel like it's really tricky. We've had to contact, you know, Kara or somebody to actually. She, she doesn't know. She how doesn't always works. know, but they have to actually um, do the grade point average for us, and then when we go back to try to see how it's calculated, and then it came back for a while, like, oh, it depends on how the teacher, you know, what they interpreted. And I feel like it gets really tricky for kids that are yeah. going to college, and their yeah. transcripts are coming out. Well, the the, the reason the reason mm -hmm. I'm concerned about it because if it's not providing usable feedback to parents and students, then what's the point? Uh, and so that's what I'm trying to assess by, by grilling you a little bit with, with the questions is that, you know, if it's not providing usable feedback that can help you understand where, where you currently stand in the class and how to improve, then it's not a, it's not a good system. I think it's usable. It's, it's just not like, it, 
not effective at knowing what you have to do in order to get your uh, grade up. Also, yeah. there's no indication of, from what, I've, from what I understand, if you're in an AP class, you get certain boost to grade at the end of the whole thing. I've, if, if, in a 100-point system, I believe it is a 10-point boost. And there's no representation of that or means of understanding that on a report card or on any grading we get back either. So we have no idea how we're doing if we inc incorporate that in addition to our grades. It is not mentioned anywhere and it is Where not it's listed weighted. anywhere. Right. The extra weighting. <coughs> so if you had that information and people were trained and you understood it, would it then be a useful system? Yes, if I was applying to colleges this year, and in looking at my grades compared to other colleges, the college's accepted grades and such, I had no clue where I was at, and I just sort of guessed, and I think, uh, based on getting the higher, like, yeah, and I think I did, I was lucky as it would get into decent schools on letters of recommendation and essay, yeah. mainly, almost entirely. Because I honestly don't full think the college fully understood what my grades were based on some of the letters I got back, but I had no clue where to look to apply to grade from a grade standpoint. Okay. I'd, and I know other students who are in the same boat because don't want, not only do we not know what our grades mean, our advisors don't know what our grades mean, and our teachers don't know what our grades mean. So there's no way of knowing where we're at even when we ask. Yeah, and that's not a good thing. Uh, I gotta leave in a minute but so <clears throat> before I go I think uh, this is going way back to the, the homework if that's all right I yeah. think a problem that I'll run into um, is I will have an assignment homework assignment and you know this I think this problem will still remain if we you know actually implement this so if a student <coughs> As a homework assignment, they and basically the issue is let's say it's a math assignment. I, I have this problem usually with math, and they don't have an understanding of the actual math that's involved, and they have to uh, like talk to a teacher about it. Because a lot of the time when I have this issue, I try to look it up. How the people that, where I try to look it up, it doesn't really. Like, I'm not able to like ask questions, I'm not able to really get the information I need in the way that I need it. So that doesn't really work. Sometimes it'll be post on something, but that's usually just like, you know, like the numerical like derivations and that I can look at it, but it doesn't mean I really understand it. So if the issue that a student is having is they go home, they have homework, they don't know how to do it, right? And they have to talk to a teacher about it, but the homework is due, right? Yeah, so the, fle the flexibility and... And yeah, dates and because I think uh, with like math assignments, I mean, in Mr. Drama, I can't, I don't, I'm not really able to do this because we pretty much just do last night's homework. We go over it at the start of class. But in physics, what I'm usually able to do is the first night I'll get the assignment. I don't fully understand it, but then I'm able to go in, come after school, understand what I have to do, get the assignment in late. And this is with tests too. A lot of the time, I take much longer on tests than other students, and. I think that's something that we should try to look like look at like that's something we should do because uh, a lot of the time students if they don't understand something they'll give up and if they do understand it they won't so I, I second that point and that is what callback does it gives you that time with that yeah that's why I like callback and the uh, enforced time not the voluntary stay late no. with and that teacher to keep to go back over it and uh, I think that's why staying after school. So you said we're gonna try to organize a thing where there'll be like late buses for students who stay after school to work on stuff with teachers. Okay, that's good. Yeah, no, that, I try to, it's, uh, it's, it, it's been beneficial, you know, whenever we start thinking of things, we try to look at the structures that we've got to build to support it before we put it in place. And so that was one of the key pieces. Are you switching? No. Um, kind of relating back to what Rowan said is like if you don't understand it, um, sometimes you just have to keep working and keep working, and that takes longer. Um, so then you do homework for longer, which is sometimes okay. But um, like today, um, including this, I have homework that I need to do right now. Um, but I'm here. Um, and I also taught youth wrestling, 
um, and I was actually in a meeting with Heather and some other people for Portrait for the of the Graduate. Yeah, good. Um, but if that homework was due um, the day after it was assigned, um, or say tomorrow, then I wouldn't be able to do any of those things. Um, and like having less homework or less demanding homework allows you to participate in things that can help the community. Um, or if it's say you're given it at the beginning of the week and it's due by the end of the week, you can decide I'm going to teach wrestling on Tuesday and Thursday and that will and I'm going to do a lot of homework these two nights and that will leave me more nights um, that will leave me the time I need for something that doesn't happen every day of the week. I feel like that's important. Yeah, you know, I think that's a, that's a, that's a college thing because they'll give you exactly. they'll, they'll give it to you up front. Yeah, and that's what we should be preparing. That's what I was for. trying to clarify is that it's not every night it's better. It's higher quality. Really, the whole homework policy, the way I understood it when I was clarifying that it's not every core subject, every night required. It's really about improving the homework that's going home, whether it's on at the beginning of the week and do it at the end of the week or do like um, give it on Monday and then it's due on Thursday or whatever so there will be a time management piece and people have the flexibility to still work or do extracurriculars. And that, that, that supports the idea of preparing students for college because typically, what do they call it? It's not an agenda, it's not an itinerary, they get a syllabus. They give you the syllabus at the beginning of the course and, and a lot of times what the instructors will do is all your work um, for the entire semester is laid out for you and, and you know when the, when the due dates are. And then you can kind of work through at your own pace. You know, some students that you know may not have to have the court, the the actual classes with the instructor before they can are able to do the work or able to get a little bit ahead and, and whatnot. Um, so that, that's not a bad idea. So that's the way. Yeah. Um, can I add that would be helpful is um, to go with the support and callback and executive functioning piece. Um, just like colleges that have like tutors and academic centers, mm -hmm. if there would be tutors after school to there's help money, that There's piece. money for that. Um, yeah. Because having a different learner at home um, to say like, no, this is how you organize because this is how it works for me is not how it's going to work yeah. for him. Or if there's teachers and students that maybe don't... Um, maybe they're not understanding that teacher very well, if there's a tutor that might, just like the su support people you have in class, having that option, I think, would be yeah. that program yeah. um, helpful. No, no, really good, really good point. We built in, of course, it was with the extra money, and we're gonna try to switch it over to the regular budget. Um, we built in summer programming. Um, for students to help them that you know want to get caught up and hopefully what we'll be able to expand it to is once we get students recovered um, we might be able to use it to get students ahead that hey you know you come in and, and, and you work on this math class during the summer for two and a half or three weeks um, that'll get you your honors designation next year or um, in some cases where it's always nice that students have the option to take calculus before they graduate if they want to don't have to um, sometimes students have to double up and so what you can do is you can teach one of the math classes during the summer um, so that like they're... Like summer school. Yeah. yeah. Um, An executive functioning school. Yep. Tutors. Yeah. And we, we, we did the transportation with it last summer. And we have money right now. Um, they're doing tutoring um, after school um, for students. It's, it's, it's open and available. Um, there is money for transportation um, for the students that are being tutored because the way it's tied to the grant. But I don't think people have been asking for it. Um, not not you. The, the 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 principals haven't come in and say, yeah, no, we need we we need the busing. Right. So I'm assuming that means that the students that are taking advantage of it don't don't need the transportation piece right now. But yeah, no, it's it's good stuff. There's a, there's a, there's so many. We kind of might as we, we can kind of close out a little bit now. But the idea, I think, we may have touched on it in this meeting, or it may have been one of the other homework pieces, is that there's so many things that that we don't do here, or hasn't been done here for a long time, that most schools do that are good things to do. Um, and you know, the after school piece and, and the after school busing and things like that are, are, are another piece of that. Having textbooks is another piece of it. 
uh, haven't been here for a long time. But it's it's taken a couple of years through the budget process, and, and COVID didn't help um, to try to start to build those things back. So it's it's a long process. I'm getting back to where we need to go. Other um, anything can can be above and beyond um, homework policy that people have questions or thoughts about, want to share or ask. Uh, what will it look like for seniors if we don't get the voucher and the days are added in the summer? Mm -hmm. will, will, they be, will we be required to stay after graduation? Will we be, and if, like, or will uh, there be marks on attendance that might affect our merit based scholarships? What would that look like for it's a, it's a, It's a state law, so I don't have flexibility unless they give us, give us the waiver. So the right now, the April days stay. Um, the remainder of the time after the April vacation, if I remember the calendar correctly, we tried to set up, is it would have to be at the end of the school year. So, well, is graduation set? Is the date set yet? Yeah, I talked with them about, you know, do we want to change this? And then you get into, you know, it's always tradition that it's this the, on, on such and such a date, you know, in, in, in June. Um, but, you know, it's possible that we could change those dates. I am hoping that we hear. Um, like I said, I, I sent out the, fr the first day we could apply for the waiver was February 1st. I sent it out that morning at like 6 a.m. Um, the state board was supposed to meet on it. They decided to delegate the authority to the Secretary of Education, which I don't believe legally they could do. They did it during COVID because the state of emergency was in effect, but when I read the, the, the law, it is the state board's responsibility. The Secretary of Education is leaving. Um, we just got the announcement, so I'm sure he's got other things that, that, that are on his mind legitimately with his transition. So I did immediately reach out to um, Heather Boucher, who was going to be the interim secretary. Um, and I give her a lot of credit. I wrote her, and I think she wrote me back within 20 minutes and said, I don't know a lot about it, but I'll, I'll figure it out for you. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful um, that, that, that we get a message, and I'm hopeful that we, we get a decision before April vacation, because I really don't want people to have to come on April vacation. So graduation is not set. Uh, the date date is set set, and I don't think we can move it. So My, the community the community does does not want it moved. I haven't even heard the date, and I haven't seen it. Do you know when the date is? I think it's the nineteenth. <laughs> it's just weird for well, a senior we don't know to if we're going to like, graduate, but then have to go to, go to these classes. Yeah. And what are they doing? They could be working. They could be, you know, there's. Oh, they're 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 completing the classes, um, but it's yeah. I'm I'm in agreement with you. The the waiver piece is key, and so and and you, you didn't hear it from me, and don't don't say that I said this, but you know it might not hurt if if uh, a couple of parents, and I know the union was was thinking about it too because it affects the teachers and their planning, of you know maybe sending the AOE a couple of nice yeah. letters, nice yeah. letters, not right. angry, but mm -hmm. you know hey you know these are these are all the things that are impacting as we're waiting for this decision. Yeah. Um, students could do that too. Um, you can send out postcards and form letters. Yeah. I think we just we're I think we're caught in just unfortunate circumstances because of that transition that's happening. Um, and, and again, I just I, I did send in. She did write back just to make sure it didn't drop off people's radar in the transition. So. So we can either just keep our fingers crossed, or, or like I said, maybe people can write a few letters. <laughs> Nice letters. <laughs> any any other on any any topic? Right. I appreciate the time. I appreciate the the discussion. Thank you for hanging out. How much homework do you got? Just just one thing for uh, AP US history. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, how about you? Uh, in this school, I'm in multiple AP classes, but I have no direct homework. I just have work for my college. The online college course. Okay. All right, good. No, uh, thank you. And uh, we're in what? Almost in April. I mean, we'll, the next open forum, um, I think I'm doing them the third Thursdays typically of the month. Um, that'll be more just kind of broadband, you know, what's on people's minds. Yeah. Um, so to clarify, cool. we have been as, often been assigned homework, but if you're in an AP class, you get a free period in which you can get it out most of your homework. Yeah. If, to, if that affects your wider point, it's not that we haven't been assigned anything at this point in the year. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. All right. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you very much.